So I'm now going to pass over to um, Henry Lucent Gore, who will chair this panel. So welcome, Henry, and um, over to you. Hello and uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, it's great to be here and thank you very much, Brian, for um, inviting me to chair this panel. Uh, we have limited time, so I'm going to be somewhat brief. Uh, so I'd like, finally, first like to introduce Dr. Peter Alexander, who is Senior Lecturer in Global Food Systems at the University of Edinburgh, to give a, a brief um, introductory um, session. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Great. Okay, thanks very much. And hopefully you can see my slides as well. My name is Peter Alexander. I'm from the University of Edinburgh, as you've just heard. Um, my research is mainly into land use and food system modeling, um, often with agent based uh, modeling approaches. So I'm going to try and give you a very brief uh, overview of, of why we need to use agent based modeling for looking at the land use and food system and give you some insights into some of the work that I've been doing in that area. So, you know, why do we need to why do we need to do models of, of land use and food uh, food system? It's, I guess it's fairly obvious, but um, at least some aspects of it. Agriculture and land use are a big driver for for environmental change, but also um, they have the ability to adapt to to environmental change. Um, so we need to think about both those aspects. And thirdly, um, land based mitigation is going to be an important aspect of, of greenhouse gas uh, removal and uh, adaption to uh, sorry, mitigation to climate change. So all of those those aspects interact and they're also all involved in uh, both human decision making and interaction with the natural environment and sort of a two way process. So we need to we need models to sort of unpick those those complex uh, interactions, both in terms of land managers, but also other, through the supply system in terms of policymakers and uh, retailers and so forth. So why do, specifically do we need um, an agent based modeling approach to to, to those systems? Um, I guess the dominant uh, modeling approach, at least at a global scale, is the integrated assessment models. And as um, Andy Haldane was mentioning, uh, you know, th th they're largely economic, including sort of assumptions about e uh, economic rationality, homogeneous actors and equilibrium markets. Um, but specifically to do with with sort of the, the land system, obviously, we have aspects we need to, to look at the, the, the spatial representations and, and those sort of dominant models tend to be very aggregate in their representations. Um, and that's perhaps not appropriate. Um, and, and lastly, I suppose they, they are, um, they're empirical rather than process based. And as a result of all of those aspects, uh, they, may, they may not be particularly realistic in their outputs, particularly under rapid or, or, or changes that are far away from the observed uh, data sets. Um, so we need, to, we need to other approaches. And ABM allows much more flexibility, allows uh, representation of cross-scale interactions and, and other things that we've been hearing through, through the other presentations as well. However, there are, as with everything, downsides. So to, to, give some, um, to give some idea of the work that I've been doing um, and to demonstrate some of the, the outcomes within the system of, of loosening those assumptions and taking an agent-based modeling approach, uh, this, this, uh, the results here look at the adoption of a perennial energy crop um, uh, within the UK and the contingent relationship with uh, the construction of biomass plants to consume those. Um, so this a ABM assumed as diffusion of innovation approach where farmers were more likely to adopt uh, the crop, the, the perennial energy crop, if they'd seen somewhere in the network who'd already had a successful experience. Um, and as a result of, of the, those assumptions, we end up with this sort of spatial diffusion process, as you can see developing on, on the maps on the left. Um, and indeed, although the, 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 these new crops were economic through the entire period of this simulation, uh, we see the sort of S-shape adoption curve, uh, which is taking sort of 20 or years to reach some, some sort of plateau. And this is a similar time lag that we've seen in an oil seal uh, rape um, adoption when the EU and the UK entered the EEC as was then. 
And we've seen other long time lags and observed data in other, in other contexts, uh, other land use contexts. But this is something, these timelines are sometimes neg often neglected outside of sort of the agent based modeling approaches. Um, here's, a, here's a different example of another agent based model, um, the Crafty uh, model, which stands for competition for resources between agent functional types. And this has been applied both at a European scale as well as some uh, national scales within, within Europe. Um, and Crafty considers supply and demand for a range of ecosystem services, not just provisioning services such as uh, food and timber. Um, but additionally, Crafty can also represent institutional decision making, uh, for example, with endogenous uh, policy making agents within the model uh, responding to, to the outcomes as, as they're simulated. Um, we're currently working on, on a UK version of Crafty um, with, a, with a number of, of partners there. So um, lastly, since we're short of time, um, in terms of, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, there are a number of challenges with ABM. And uh, I think a lot of those arise from the, from the flexibility, if you like. You know, the aim is to represent more processes, so that tends to bring in more complexity. Um, and, and that issue, I think, is compounded by the fact that there's no accepted theory of what you know, human decision-making processes should be. And therefore, it's hard to know what to include and what not to include in the model. Um, and frequently, there, there are many parameters, therefore, in these models that are not well known. And there's not usually comprehensive data to, for which we can use to calibrate against them. Validation is often a problem as well, uh, again, to, to lack of data. But, but with these complex models with very large degrees of freedom um, or dimensionality, as was described earlier, um, I think it's closer in many of the models I've been describing to 10 to the 8, uh, again, referring to Andy Haldane, than it is to the sort of handful he was mentioning in other cases. Um, and, and therefore, with this high dimensionality, it's difficult to necessarily reproduce, reproduce the observed behavior. Um, and then it's somewhat challenging to, to, to know what to do with that. Do you constrain the model to try and produce the right answer for the wrong reasons or, or not? Um, also, they're stochastic very often and we have a number of aspects of uncertainty. So we need to think about quantification of that through some level of uncertainty, uh, sensitivity analysis. Um, and that can be also challenging because the models are often slow to run even on, on you know, with large computing resources. So, the, so the, the complexity is basically a trade-off with um, to create all of these these different challenges. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Let me try and stop sharing my screen. That's always the challenging part. Thank you very much, Peter, for that um, interesting introductory from one strand of uh, a particular type of modeling. I'm now going to ask Helen Wilkinson, who's Director of Risk Solutions, to, big, to, to give a brief overview of uh, the modeling she's been involved in. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Henry. Uh, and thanks, Brian, who's going to be driving my slides for me uh, due to a problem with computers at this end. Um, Henry asked me to say a few words about an uh, agent-based model that we um, put together for DEFRA and the Environment Agency a few years ago, looking at water abstraction reform. And um, the reason this model was commissioned was because uh, with what with climate change and increases in population, it was becoming clear that the system that regulates how much water abstractors can take from rivers and from aquifers across the country was becoming increasingly less uh, fit for purpose. Um, and so the aim of the agent-based modeling was to explore what reform might look like, what was the best way to, to reform the system. So Brian, if you could give me my first slide. Thank you. Um, so what we produced was a combination of two models, a hydrological model, which was developed by H.R. Wallingford. And uh, this was a gridded uh, geographical model, um, which uh, monitored the amount of water in rivers and in aquifers uh, and communicated with an economic behavioral model, uh, which was our agent-based model, um, which uh, tracked the water that abstractors were taking, was taking out of the river and the aquifers. Uh, and the two models communicated on a daily time step basis. Um, the modeling period that we covered was 25 years from 2025 to 2050. And over that time, Brian, if you could give me the, the next slide, please. Um, we could track all sorts of things like the supply of water and the demand for water, um, the trading that took place. So under the new systems, there was much freer um, support for trading of water 
uh, and we could see who was trading with who, at what times of the year, how much water they were trading and what sort of prices were being paid. And we could also look at investment decision making. Um, so our agents in the model were uh, largely abstractors themselves, plus the regulator, and the abstractors could uh, learn, they could see what other people were adopting, they could um, in implement uh, water efficiency and water storage, for example. So they might build water storage on their land in order to get them through uh, times of water scarcity. And this allowed us to build up an overall picture of the costs, benefits and risks of the different regulatory reforms we were looking at. Uh, so if you could click again, please, Brian. Um, we looked at three different ways of reforming the system. Uh, one of those was the do nothing uh, option. Uh, the other two were slightly different ways of, of regulating the system. And within those three policies, we could also look at um, different detailed responses. Um, so just tweak the regulation design and see what impact that had. And we do, looked at that under a range of climate change and socioeconomic scenarios, so different ways that the world might develop in future. And so the challenges that we faced were very much the ones that we've heard people describing earlier and are common to any large complex model. Um, the models were data hungry, you needed a lot of data inputs to set them up and it was quite time consuming to set them up. Um, it was almost impossible to do any traditional form of validation of, of comparing model outputs with, with data describing things that happened in the past. Um, and they produced very large quantities of output information. So we were tracking individual behaviors, uh, abstractors behavior across each of our case study catchments for 25 years. So it was day by day. So there's a lot of information there. And we found that the results were quite often um, counterintuitive. So the reforms rippled out across the, the, the catchment, the impact of the reform rippled out in uh, quite unexpected ways and uh, they were quite sensitive to the different climate change and socioeconomic scenario chosen. Um, so there wasn't a single right answer, there wasn't a single um, way of reforming the, the system which would work under all circumstances. Um, so this gave us quite a, a challenge I think in communicating um, to some of the policymakers that we work with, why use this sort of modelling when it wasn't coming up with a single clear answer. And there was also a challenge from the abstractors who were involved in the process and from policymakers to say, you're not modelling every aspect of the catchments, you're not modelling every aspect of decision making. How do we know that you've chosen the right uh, things to model? How do we know that the answers in some way are going to be right? Um, so uh, what we had to do was communicate the, the role of the modelling. We weren't trying to fo forecast the futures in these particular um, catchments. We weren't trying to say this is what will happen in, in the future exactly. We were just trying to explore how the different policies might, might behave, what sorts of things were going to be driving the costs and risks and benefits, um, and, and get a deeper understanding of how the system was working. And to do this, it was really important that we work collaboratively. Um, so we had workshops with abstractors from in each of our case study catchments and from different industries. Uh, we had a steering group and peer review group and an abstractor representative group. And we met with those at regular intervals throughout the whole course of the, of the project, which took place over several years. Um, at the beginning, we were sharing with them how we were planning to structure the model. Um, we were, shared very importantly emerging findings throughout the whole process so for example we would share with abstractors what the model was telling us about how they might be making what decisions they might be making during the modeling period and they could tell us if that looked sensible so it helped validate the model it helped um, give us confidence and give other people confidence that the model was telling us sensible things um, and it helped us interpret the results and it helped uh, our client, who happened to be Henry, uh, to interpret the results in sensible ways in terms of designing the policy. So next uh, slide, please, Brian. Um, in summary, I think I, I'd like to say that agent-based models are entirely suited for modeling natural systems and particularly the complex interactions between natural systems and human systems, human behavior. Um, but you have to recognize that uh, 
the, or for us, the most important thing wasn't the number that we got out to the end. Yes, those were useful and they were used in the impact assessment for the reforms. Um, but the real strength of the method was that the amount of learning and insights it gave us into how these reforms were operating down or could be expected to operate down on the ground. And we would, I would say that, yes, data and validation challenges are really real and they've got to be recognised, but they shouldn't be as uh, used as an excuse not to model or not to use the results. It's the way you use them that's an important thing. Um, so that point, I'll just say the last slide, please, um, Brian. There was a lot of people involved in this process of modelling. Here's just a few of them. I'd like to say thank you to them all and especially to all the stakeholders who bore with us through periods of uh, severe drought and severe flooding uh, and still continue to participate in the projects. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Helen. And yes, I uh, remember all this very well. It was um, very exciting, but a hugely challenging uh, process uh, indeed. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gary Pothill, um, Paul Hill, Senior Research Scientist, the James Hutton Institute. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Gary Polhill. You should be able to see me and I hope uh, you're seeing my slides as well. Uh, so yes, I'm a Senior Research Scientist at the James Hutton Institute and I've been working for mm, just over the last 20 years on uh, agent-based modelling in uh, food and environmental systems. Uh, I'd just like to give a, a quick acknowledgement to my collaborators, Tony Craig, Andrea Scalco, Keith Matthews, Doug Salt and Jachi Ger. Uh, Jachi is now at the University of Leeds. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just give you an overview of uh, some of the uh, modelling work we've done before um, giving a little bit more attention, I think, to some of the challenges we need to address uh, if we are to achieve the mainstreaming of agent-based modelling. Um, uh, one piece of work we did for a European project called Glamours uh, was to explore the uh, difference between building a new bypass and changing uh, the flexi time arrangements of employees in Aberdeen um, on uh, carbon dioxide emissions from uh, tailpipes as people commute in and out of town every day. And um, I mean, the key point there was that actually the most effective thing was uh, to increase flexi time. Uh, and although there were small gains in uh, building a bypass, these were for um, these were for uh, commuting time rather than for carbon emissions, which actually were slightly worse because people can drive faster. And uh, I think the key take home message there is that often it is social rather than physical uh, and infrastructure innovations and changes that are, uh, that are needed uh, to achieve um, more sustainable outcomes. In another piece of work, um, again with Jachi, um, we explored how Brexit might affect uh, Scottish beef and dairy farmers and came up with the classic uh, agent-based modelling answer that it depends a lot. It depends on the Brexit scenario and uh, we contrast uh, two of them in the uh, uh, diagrams below, the, the maps you can see. It also depends, as the maps also show, where you are in Scotland. But critically, it, it further depends on which social processes are modelled. So if you were to look at, let's say, the uh, uh, left-hand panel, the unilateral free trade one, uh, the two diagrams, the two maps that you can see there uh, have been generated using different assumptions about the processes driving uh, changes in herd size um, in Scotland by, by farmers. And it's not always the case that the, that the simplest model that fits the data uh, is the one that um, you should necessarily use. There can be lots of ways of uh, fitting uh, data and uh, getting uh, insights from the, from the model as a result. Um, and so uh, I think this has increased some of my um, internal criticism of uh, heuristics such as Occam's razor. In another European project that's um, currently ongoing, uh, we are working with Aberdeen City Council to ex explore scenarios of adopting the heat network 
um, that they are developing, well, they already have uh, small heat networks already, but they wish to expand them uh, in order to use heat from waste incineration. And again, there, people have got to make a one-shot decision about whether to join or not. And the only way they can do that is by drawing on information from other people's experience. And so hence their social networks, the advice that they can access, and their perceptions of the uh, organizations from whom they access advice uh, all become very important and then significant to model. In a paper in Geoinformatica uh, last year, um, I drew on Jeffrey Moore's um, Crossing the Chasm book for the marketing literature to try and examine why it is that agent-based modeling, despite arguably being around for 50 years and more, uh, isn't more routinely used um, in the kind of uh, circles that we have been discussing today. Um, and there, I think uh, our initial analysis of the literature is that really we're at the innovators or early adopters stage. We are not yet at the stage of appealing to the pragmatists who are uh, initial uh, uh, early majority to use some of the language of Rogers innovation uh, adoption curve. And we identified a number of themes that we think need to be worked on to bring agent based modeling uh, to a stage where people can really see its benefits. Um, and start to be able to use it. And a lot of these have been touched on, not only by uh, previous speakers in, in this panel, but also uh, speakers and panelists uh, earlier in the day. Um, we need to look at, for example, um, understanding uh, unintended consequences in complex systems. We need to find ways of making our models more transparent and open so that people understand the assumptions we're using. Um, one subject we've only touched on a little today is the question of ethics. Um, and I think we could do more to link to uh, ongoing initiatives in the implementation and um, interdisciplinary sciences, uh, uh, where we could, we, as um, was said this morning, for example, um, there is a lack of uh, education and people uh, coming through uh, with the skills in agent-based modeling to be used. And of course, uh, I think it's been adequately covered by both the previous speakers, there are issues with empiricism, uh, especially with validation, um, though that's not to say that other modeling approaches don't have their little challenges with validation as well, but also on coming to an understanding of how we might use these kinds of models for prediction. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. <clears throat> um, uh, a lot of material. Obviously, the thing about uh, we've only got an hour and there's huge numbers of conversations you could have about agent-based modeling. So first, we're, we've tried to sort of divide this into different topics, but I'm going to invite uh, Helen, Gary, and Peter to put on their cameras and uh, microphones and join for an hour discussion. Thank you. And we had a bit of a get together beforehand and tried to divide the sort of issues topics into three areas, uh, which are first the role, discussing how the role of agent-based modeling differs uh, from other sorts of modeling, where authority comes from, from agent-based models, and how you communicate. And these seem to be particular challenging um, uh, questions, uh, issues for agent-based modeling. So I'm going to start by asking Helen to sort of open the discussion on, uh, on the role of agent-based modeling. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, what we, uh, what I tried to, to set out in our in my presentation was her's the role of agent based modeling is really to help you understand the system. So they're ideally suited to uh, modeling systems where there's a lot of complex characteristics. So feedbacks, learning agents, emergent behavior, um, things that you can't understand by looking at the individual agents or elements of the system in isolation. You've got to put them together and see how they, they interact and evolve over time. Um, and agent based models let you do this. Um, but they 
do so by providing you with a lot of complex data and information, which is a reflection of the complexity of the system you're looking at, um, and so uh, not by producing a single answer at the end. And uh, I'm just going to, um, and so the, the role is really in deepening and developing this understanding of structuring conversations that you can have with your stakeholders, with people who are going to use the information. Um, and then it's not about going away, writing a model, and this was said this morning, going away, writing a model in isolation and presenting somebody with an answer. Um, the role is very much more about structuring discussions and enabling you to have really intelligent discussions, sometimes about quite controversial things, but in a, in a, a neutral space. The, the model gives you that neutral uh, structure within which to have conversations. Uh, thank you, Helen. Yes, I mean, it is interesting how, uh, I mean, there's a certain picture of modelling that you send modellers off to the corner to work out the answers and come and tell you it. And obviously, agent-based modelling doesn't work like that. I mean, Gary, how, in terms of the, the, the work you've done, for instance, uh, um, you know, with the Scottish government and so forth, have you found that you have to approach uh, the use of agent-based modelling in a very different sort of way? I, I think the, the, the main thing, um, in that kind of work is accepting that the model is part of a portfolio of evidence uh, on which policymakers uh, might draw when forming policy. So it is not going to be, you are not going to be the sole authority that they come and talk to. Um, and there are going to be lots of other people, but that uh, actually having diverse sources of evidence is very welcome. Um, and I, th I think this is the important point i think we you know certainly very recently with the with the covid crisis the uh, the key has been uh, you know how much we do what the model says we do rather than um, sort of discuss it in the context of what's socially acceptable and what can work and so there's a limit to what we can uh, i think advise um, uh, on that front but we can at least use uh, these models to explore things and i i think there's also a recognition that we're not providing crystal balls that are going to tell us exactly what's going to happen uh, you know if a policymaker does x y or z uh, the authority comes i think from working with people i think i, I think helen gave a very good example there uh, working with people throughout the, the model development process um, getting their input and feedback um, and uh, explaining to them carefully how to interpret what we're what we're seeing um, let's just, leaving authority aside, Peter, I just wonder, do you think policy people are less comfortable with a, uh, an agent-based model? Um, and, and how do you sort of get over that? I think they probably are less comfortable because they have less experience in, in the main with that type of model. Um, and, you know, to, 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 to sort of put it back to the communication point, I, I, would, uh, I would see that largely as about representing uncertainty or understanding uncertainty, both model uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, and ver various types of uncertainty. Um, you know, so if we develop one single model and it gives one, sing one set of answers, that's only exploring part of that space. And as Helen was saying, each of these models develop large amounts of output, and therefore kind of navigating that is, is extremely difficult. And that's compounded if you then think about trying to explore multiple models and trying to explore that sort of, uh, uh, as I say, model uncertainty as well as the individual um, sensitivities within within that single model. So it's very much moving away from the the one answer uh, that, that that everybody wants. You know, we all want to know that it's forty two or whatever it might be, but unfortunately, that that isn't that isn't isn't possible. And um, you know, communicating those that range uh, in a meaningful way is is extremely challenging. Um, perhaps in a funny way, one of the outcomes of COVID has been exploring, uh, you know, increasing the, the the literacy of many people who were previously not as uh, exposed to 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 exploring some of those aspects uh, have been kind of forced to be so so perhaps that will have a strange uh, beneficial outcome um, related to this yes i mean um one of the things i suppose here is that you have to have that space for interaction with people and explanation 
Um, I mean, and, and that is always a, a challenge to actually get the attention, isn't it? Um, um, Helen, how did you think our, our interactions went over the years? I mean, um, and, and how could, do you think they could have gone better? Uh, oh, uh, right, well, um, remember right back to the beginning. I think they really went very well on the whole, and they were really critical of the success of the whole modelling project. I, I know how they could have gone worse. I think um, yourselves and the Environment Agency and uh, Natural Resources Wales and the Welsh Government showed great patience. It was a difficult process, learning how to do the modelling and structuring the model and uh, getting the right sort of things into it was not not easy decisions to make um, and we made we, we sometimes turned up to meetings with complete failure you know things have fallen over entirely and yet people were in were prepared to engage with us were to discuss what was happening how we could improve things how we needed to take things forward and it was that patience uh, with us that really helped um, one of the play areas that we really really struggled with was every time we ran the models and got results out, these very detailed results about the decisions that abstractors were making over long time periods, something would happen and someone in our, our stakeholder group, whichever group it was, would say, why did that happen? And we would have to go away and delve into the model and, and run the narrative back and find out why these particular decisions had been made, what was going on in the environment around us. And we'd you know, we had all sorts of ways of, of drawing graphs of the results and things that was trying to help us explore the data better. Um, since we finished that project, we've been doing another one on railways and with the city university's help have developed a whole suite of interactive visualizations, which throw the data up into, into pictures and graphs and geographical representations, representations that the rail industry are used to using to look at their own data so that we can then interactively explore the data in much more detail. If we'd had that sort of tool available to us when we were interacting with our groups uh, with water abstraction reform, I think it would have made it much, much easier to tell the stories, to find out why things were happening, to explain what was going on in, our, in this very, very complex system. So I think that's what we could really have done better. Yes, my learning from that was that um, if we'd we, because of the timelines of doing, uh, I mean, there's an expectation of having lots of data representing reality. And if you rush to having too complicated or too data full model early, it's much less easy to interpret. Whereas maybe if you start with a model which is a bit more stereotypical, you know, you can maybe begin to understand the dynamics of the model, which help you later understanding what is going on, which is always the, the big. Uh, the big challenge. Peter, what, I mean, are you got any hints or lessons or, or in terms of how you communicate, how you get people on board and uh, to understand? Well, I think, I think you, you, you've stressed a lot about engagement. And I think that's absolutely right. But I, I think you also need to have the, the, the buy-in that this is going to take a lot longer than you perhaps expect that it would or should or could. Um, and that's that's just the nature the nature of the beast, uh, unfortunately, or so it would seem, uh, from from bitter experience, I suppose I should say, uh, and and also that it's maybe you know like everything's everything's an eighty twenty rule, right? And in in in, in ABM land, I would say it's twenty percent of the time is to get the model that that works, technically that you know that produces output and takes has has all the most of the representations of of the processes you that you wish to to capture and it, but they unfortunately the 80 percent of the time is is kind of calibrating that tuning that validating that going backwards and forwards fi finding the bugs perhaps in either in the, the logical bugs the way you've kind of maybe missed specified some of the processes and that that's part of the learning outcomes that's part of the sort of the results of the model that that are beneficial you, you think oh i thought the system worked this way but if i actually encode it that way i get this very strange outcome that's clearly not correct so maybe my maybe some of my my, my original assumptions are wrong um, or perhaps you've just written the code wrong. There's a whole bunch of different things that could could be tripping you up in that period, but that that whole process is is quite um, fraught and slow, uh, and and um, I think from a, a policy perspective, from in my experience, that the, there's a always seems to be a rush 
from yeah. from this from from the other side of the fence a rush to to try and get the answers out as quickly as possible as well as it being 42 we want to, we want to be told it's 42 we want to be told tomorrow um and and in a sense ne neither neither of those aspects are are entirely possible sadly yeah i think the thing is that um you have to be you know if you're used to other sorts of models, simpler models, you know, traditional um, economic models, it is often simpler to get answers out. And you don't, you know, in terms of planning this, you don't expect, I mean, we never, when we first started with Helen, we never planned that we needed a long time to try and understand what the model was saying. And of course we had a, a policy, in policy, you often have drop dead deadlines. You've got to produce this by such and such time. Uh, and, and it becomes, uh, a, a nightmare. Gary, um, what sort of, how do you manage this sort of interaction? What's your experience? So um, I think um, I have a, di I mean, I suppose I have a diverse experience. Um, I usually uh, go into less detail about what's in the model. It's, you know, it's features and uh, uh, bells and whistles and concentrate much more on a sort of a high level description um, and trying to give a potted summary of, of the results and what the model's telling me. Um, and uh, so I think it can be a mistake as a, as a modeler, you know, as someone who enjoys building models, I think you can get a little bit too thrilled about all the wonderful things your model does and the social theories you've drawn on and all this sort of thing. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I say, I think the, the it depends on the people you're working with, partly, and the context in which you're working. So in some projects, you will have regular interaction with policy advisors and policy analysts who, um, you know, want to get the latest update on what the model is doing. Um, in other in other projects, um, it's it's more commonly the case. I would say that you're you're giving them updates maybe once a year or something like that. And then you just need to come to them with something new. Like I say, I, th I think the key, um, and I, I mean, I appreciate this point about the, um, I appreciate very much this point about needing uh, urgent answers um, by a deadline. Um, and I think uh, the key there actually is partly to anticipate what might what answers might be needed shall we say a few years down the line and and, and actually in fact um, through these irregular um, uh, interactions with policymakers they're often quite willing to tell you and they'll have some idea of the things they're currently afraid of uh, going down the line and we can we can well imagine what they'll be now you know people are afraid of uh, what might happen with Brexit or, or in the long term, never mind in the, in the immediate short term, or what might happen with the future pandemic. And so there are, you know, well, and, and how we achieve net zero. I mean, there are positive things they're maybe not afraid of, but want to achieve and have no idea how. So starting to develop the capability to deliver these answers now um, means you're not on the back foot when um, you're asked for an answer in uh, you know a few hours in a few years time thanks gary I, one thing we've we've covered a lot of communication and and role and how age based models are much more interactive and require a lot of more dialogue and conversation um, i was wondering just one one point that we we'd mentioned earlier is this question of authority uh, which we haven't really covered so much and uh, a lot of people criticize agent-based models in terms agent-based models in terms of uh, the difficulty of um, verification. Um, what Gary, I mean, when you you know present the especially something high profile like the effects of Brexit, presumably, and people ask you, well, how how you any idea that this is, you know, we can rely on this? I mean, what do you say? So, I mean, with that particular piece of work, there's a there was a particular phenomenon that we were interested in called the, the disappearing middle. So what we're finding in the farming industry, for example, is that um, small sized farmers are growing rapidly and sort of large industrial sized farmers are also growing in numbers. 
but these seem both to be at the expense of the uh, medium-sized uh, businesses. Um, and so what we did was looked in the literature for various um, phenomena that might be uh, responsible for that, you know, the kind of social phenomena in the farming community. Uh, and there were, you know, diverse explanations. Um, we're very lucky at the James Hutton Institute that we're able to draw on interdisciplinary expertise. So we've got, you know, rural sociologists and who, who we can just go and talk to and, and ask about this sort of thing. Um, and so we identified these four processes, um, the, the question of succession um, and, and the three other ones. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what they are for the purposes of this discussion. Um, and then we, we found a way to model them. And then we found out, we, we explored which combinations of these factors reproduce the disappearing middle. Now, not necessarily numerically, but did we get the pattern of um, uh, increasing small size farms, increasing uh, larger size farms and decreasing medium sized farms? And so that was, you know, having identified the combinations of factors that did that, we could then run them forward with the uh, mm, Brexit scenarios that we were we were given to work with, and uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the authority and and whether you believe what we've done or not, well, uh, I guess you can see the model as a theorem prover to say, well, we we have this set of assumptions and we're completely open with you about what they are, and if you want to download the model source code, it's all there. Um, um, and uh, if you so, if you accept those assumptions and you run the model forward, then this is the these are the answers you're going to get. But also, there's a lot. I mean, as Peter was saying, there's a lot of uncertainty in outcome, um, and this uncertainty, uh, I think, is is a strength of agent-based modeling rather than um, some people saying uh, some people might see it as a weakness, because you can start to um, you can start to see how perhaps quite naive assumptions. Um, can lead to qualitatively different um, outcomes. And um, in terms of comparing with, uh, with other modeling approaches um, that, that aren't able to sort of reflect that level of structural uh, and uh, quantitative uncertainty in quite the same way, um, I think it uh, reduces your confidence uh, that a particular policy is necessarily going to work. And so then the kind of language you might use would be less about, well, how do we optimize policy? So how do we know, you know, exactly how we're going to get the best possible outcome for every last penny of taxpayers' money, which might seem on the face it, of it to be reasonable. We can ask instead, well, what's, how do we minimize maximum regret? How do we design policies that are robust to all of this uncertainty? And I think in some ways that that's much more valuable, even if it ends up being in a situation where, you know, yes, with the benefit of hindsight, we could maybe have spent the money better, but then we would have risked a hell of a lot of um, other things going wrong that could have been far more costly. Yeah, it's interesting because I suppose you can say, well, at least our modelling does, uh, you know, with Asian-based modelling, you can have the potential to find the out bad things happening that you might not expect, whereas most modelling can't really do that so as you seem to have an advantage there with your experience in that you had sort of things you could look at see consistent with what was going on in the past and so on i mean helen with the agent-based modeling it was a lot more difficult because these were a whole new set of policies and 25 years down the track um so a bit more of a challenge maybe it was uh, yes it was in the past we've um modeled photomatoses, spread of photomatoses, and we had the 2001 outbreak, which was a lot of mini outbreaks, which gave us a great mass of data to validate the model against. Um, even that doesn't tell us how under changing agricultural practices it would then behave in the future, but it was a much better grounding. What we tended to do was, was we used um, Nick Taylor's approach for, for model validation, which was first of all, is, is the way that you're setting the model up. Does it make technical sense, operational sense? Um, scientific sense and we tested that by by running the the algorithms we were going to use the rules we were going to use uh, the structure of the model past our, our stakeholder groups and our advisory groups and our experts um, we then looked to see whether we could reproduce um, there was very limited historical data that we were in a position to sort of model and compare with but we did go out to sort of small groups of, of 
farmers and to the water industry and say, look, here's a set of circumstances. This is what the model is telling us the abstractors are going to be doing in those circumstances. Does that seem sensible to you? Does that ring true to you that the, the model is predicting or, or suggesting things might happen that you think would have would happen in those circumstances. So that gave us a second level. And then the, the third level of, of validation, which Nick always says is, is it producing answers that can be used? And so it, is it going to be useful in, in a sense? Um, and there we were reacting all the time, our steering board were people who were going to be using the results. And so they could say, yes, that's the sort of information we need. That's the sort of detail we need. Yes, we understand the limitations because they've been involved in all these discussions. We understand the strengths. And so that to us then said, this is a valid model. And the fact that people had been involved in the process, a wide range of people had been involved in the process and felt confident that it was giving them information that they could use and could trust uh, was the validation for us. But it's a different process to a traditional one. And I suppose the thing is that for the people who are directly involved, then you can gain that authority. The problem is more challenge if you have to then go to a set of people who never were involved at all and, uh, and don't necessarily understand, you know, haven't gone through the whole education process. Actually, there's an interesting question from Bruce Edmonds. How can we educate policy users and models more broadly? Peter, what do you reckon? For the education question. Uh, I mean, I, I guess there's, the, there's only one way to learn anything, and that's by doing, right? Uh, largely speaking, and I think that would apply in this case. You know, it's it's through the uh, going through projects where there is this engagement that we've been talking about, and uh, and that that will that will create uh, that education, and and hopefully that will become you know broader based. I, I, th I think to sort of pick up on some, something that Gary said during his presentation, and I, I nearly said, but actually stopped myself saying, is that we, in, in one way or another, um, we always seem to be at the dawn of the, of the, the, the expansion of, of ABM and the, and the use of ABM. It's always, you know, tomorrow that, um, that it's going to fulfill the promise that, that it, that it has. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 we, we seem to be saying that again today, and maybe we're right this time, but it does feel a little bit deja vu that we, maybe this, not exactly this group of people, although perhaps Gary and I have been saying it together before, but, um, but you know, um, I, I, I wonder, I wonder whether it really, really, it will be, or whether it's another false dawn. Wait, can I jump in there? Henry. Go on, go for it, Gary. Yeah, because, I mean, I think we need to manage our, our sort of um, assessments of ourselves and our expectations of ourselves, and therefore. There are not, for example, in universities, whole entire departments dedicated to agent-based modelling, right? So we are a relatively small community. And I think in, in, in view of that, you have to say, well, actually, to have got as much attention as we have, we've done remarkably well. We are not yet part of the establishment uh, that uh, people call on to do this. And it's partly to do with lack of exposure, lack of awareness, lack of appreciation that actually a modeling exercise is something that you need to participate in, not something that you, you know, give away to somebody else and they'll come back and tell you the answer is 42. But, you know, it's a little bit different. And um, so, I, I mean, I know it's a rotten thing to say, and, and academics always bloody say this, but uh, at the end of the day, it needs resources putting into it to um, develop the science and the knowledge and the methods and all of those things that I showed in my last slide, and I'm sure a few other things besides, uh, whereby, you know, we have the theoretical and uh, uh, scientific basis on which to be able to go out to people and say, yeah, you know, here's a model of your scenario. Here's what we think goes on. Here are all these uncertainties and all these other things that might, that might be understood. And when it comes to things like complexity, I often find that, you know, maybe that's a bit of a turn off, but people understand things like unintended consequences. They understand them. So sometimes it's about using the right terminology to pick up on things that people are worried about. Um, 
rather than using sort of more academic uh, language like complex systems, which I think is, is not something everybody understands. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, Helen, I wanted to bring you in particularly because I think agent-based modeling is, has been much more successful in some areas than other, has, others, hasn't it? Like defense, uh, um, public health. Um, where it, you know, it has got a status that um, um, that it hasn't in, in 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 other areas. Is there anything we can learn from that? I yeah, I, I don't know what I was going to say with us. We're we're a very small private company. We we don't have a massive reach, but we work very closely with a number of people who are using agent-based models um, very frequently. So in terms of I don't know much about public health, but in terms of disease risk management, foot and mouth disease in animals, um, it's a, it was one of our agent-based models, which is used by DEFRA as their routine way of planning for the next outbreak of foot and mouth disease. It showed its worth in the last outbreak and when the uh, disease escaped from Perbright, um, and uh, people trust it and they're, they're confident in it. They worked on the development of the model. They know how to use it. Slightly more broader application, the railway model we're developing at the moment. Uh, we're working with people in the railway industry who are very used to using complex simulation models to plan the new timetable, for example. Um, and the agent-based modeling is allowing them to take a, a step beyond that to do more what ifs on a, a model which actually is simpler to set up for run than the big simulation models they use um, and uh, that's people are really getting it straight away oh yes this is something we can use this is something that's telling us the questions to ask about our problem and how we might be able to solve it we can do experiments in the computer instead of having to run trains on track to do our experiments which is damned expensive um, and takes lots of setting up to make sure you're doing it safely uh, and, and so just working with people, they get enthusiastic about this method. And I guess it goes back to some of the talks this morning on, on modeling innovation, that it's a diffusion process that people become involved and they do it, they like it, they can see how it works for them and then they'll start using it more widely. But I wish I knew what the answer was to, to selling people that complex problems don't have simple solutions and something like agent-based modeling at least allows you to understand the, the sources of complexity and what it's doing to you. And, and we've got a question from a, a PhD student uh, who's saying, um, yeah, it's all very well if you've got a whole policy uh, uh, um, client and you can bring people together, but of course people have to get started. So if you're starting in an agent-based modeling space, how can you create the processes or get people involved to experiment with these interactions? Because, I, you know, the PhD, the student model is generally you're in a corner not talking to people uh peter well so am i wrong maybe this is just... um I, I think it's possible to to get some level of interactions i mean the the other choice is of course literature um there's plenty usually plenty of of literature on almost every topic we don't know exactly what this phd student is studying but you know if it's if it's a particularly policy relevant area then there's there's certainly no barrier to, to to speaking to their supervisors and getting in touch with uh, with some relevant people you might not be able to have the resources to run a 50 100 person workshop uh, for two days but um, I would have thought uh, some more focused conversations would be entirely possible um, equally it's not unheard of to have PhD students to who have both a modeling sort of chapter or two in their PhD, but also do some more uh, you know, focus groups. Uh, they do run workshops, they have surveys, other, other, other methods to, to get uh, interaction in the way that we've described, at least in some, uh, to some degree. So yeah, I think that it's not a lost cause. And I mean, are there any rules of thumb? Are there any better ways of structuring things? There was a question about uh, using user panels and expert advisory groups. Um, you know, are there any particular, is the best practice in terms of how you involve people, or how you structure things? Helen, what do you, what do you reckon? I don't know, that's a good question. What, what have we done? We, we almost always have a steering group. They're always better if they've got a strong chair and that they recognize that at the end of the day, the modelers have to say what's possible to model and what isn't possible to model. Um, you need somebody in there, the sort of devil's advocate to break the 
natural enthusiasm of, of our modelers at least and our clients to model everything that moves <laughs> so you want to put everything in the model as well and so somebody has to say oh, do you really want to do that is that really what you want uh, so you need people to take different roles um, we would love to have more time in our programs for interacting with people on the ground people who are going to who are, are working in the system you're trying to model you usually don't get enough time i think uh, doing that and reflecting back the emerging findings of your model. Uh, I think a mixture of ways of interacting is best. It's great to have a steering group, but it's also immensely powerful to be able to sit down with a small group of people who are intimately involved in the system. So on the railway, we're working with the performance managers in train operating companies, um, as well as with a more sort of high level authoritative steering group um, so they the steering group give us the big answers the people down at the ground are telling us this is what we want this is what we need this is the sort of information we, we, we're taking out of your model is that right um, so yeah I, I think a mi every project should have a mix of different ways of interacting with people thanks Alan yes uh, there's no easy answer to any of this is there? there's no yeah, a bit of everything Gary what have you got any thoughts on this particular question I just would caution, I mean, not every agent-based model is, uh, you know, even if it's policy relevant, it's not necessarily uh, built for policymakers or with policymakers. It doesn't have to be. And so I think that, you know, there is a risk of, of saying, well, if I want to say anything useful, uh, you know, about some you know, big major issue, I don't know, like biodiversity or climate change and how we address these things, then I must have a whole bunch of stakeholders uh, in my project. And I think it, you know, it, it's quite fine to uh, work you know, um, on an agent-based model and, and uh, gain insights for yourself. That, that this is fine too. It's, I, I remember reading of, uh, an article where uh, there were policymakers saying that they were a little bit sick of scientists phoning them up to have impact. <laughs> so I think the, the question of you know, how you get in there, I think that's partly determined by the project. So that the, you know, if a project is, is going to be delivering to stakeholders, then it will have been uh, constituted in that way. And if your project isn't about that, then you don't have to bring them in necessarily. You could, or, but you could still interview them, you, uh, you know, if they're willing to, to meet you, gain qualitative evidence for them, read the literature, as, as Peter said, um, uh, or, or perhaps have a, um, a steering group, as Helen said, you know, where maybe your supervisors could help organize it for you. So I, I wouldn't, I would be cautious about seeing it as the, the be all and end all of whether your model is right or good or, uh, or useful. And, and also we, we should be broader than just policymakers. We, it's any, any stakeholders. We, we, we've been using policymakers almost as a, a proxy to, to a broader stakeholder group. Hmm. Well, Nigel Gilbert's very informative on the uh, diverse forms of, you know, what is a policymaker? Uh, anyway, it's a very difficult term. Well, of course, we, as, as a policymaker, I have to say, of course, we are the most important people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, you're right. In, you know, how policy is made, of course, is a whole subject and who influences it, in what way and how, when and how it emerges. You know, all, you know it, it's, a, it's a whole topic in itself. Um, we're just about to run out of, uh, uh, of time uh, and hopefully people have found this a useful and, and stimulating uh, discussion. I'll just, um, 30 seconds, I'll give uh, each of you to say a final thought uh, to wrap up. And uh, I'll start with Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Agent-based models are great. They're a really, really powerful tool. We should use them more. We should be careful in how we use them. But if we use them properly, they're very, very good, very. Best Thanks, Alan. That's great. That's, agent models are great. <laughs> Shall we make agent model, agent models, agent based models great again? Do you think? Gary, <laughs> what, do you, <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, I I I, I think uh, Helen's right, and I think that needs to be backed up by investment so that we can do the science, so that this isn't just a, another, you know, false hope or false dawn. Thank you, Gary. Peter. I was going to say false hope or false dawn, but I'll, I'll say something else, which is um, not one model to rule them all. Yeah. We need that pl plurality. We need many models in any particular topic. We can't just have one that does, that does everything and gives us, the, again, the right answer with uncertainty. We need 
We need multiple models. Um, and that's one way to get validation is into model comparison. And I think actually it's great. I've, I've really enjoyed this and it's been a great discussion. And to have conversations between people who are working on this to learn from each other and also make, you know, see that there is a reason why, you know, there's, it's great to see all the different models that are being done. Uh, and I think, you know, I really hope and, and, you know, especially with the work Brian's doing as well, that we, you know, we can take this, um, take this all forward and it's not a false storm. Thank you very much all and I'll pass on to, to Brian now. Yes, very, very quickly then, because obviously we were just over time. But thank you all for excellent contributions, as always, and a great discussion. Um, and this, we said this is the start of a process, so I'm sure we'll be able to engage with the network much more. I want to say a big thank you. Uh, for those who are on sort of, uh, the attendees, we do have a final panel looking at health and social policy that will start at 4.30, so we hope to see you then. But again, my big thanks to, to Gary, Helen, Peter, and to you, Henry. Um, hope you have a safe trip back and um, look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.